everyone. Welcome to another webinar with RankSense. I hope you're all staying safe and doing well. I'm Brittany, and I'll just be going through the chats and answering some of your questions. Today, we're joined by Antoine Aripert from Lilygo, and he's going to demonstrate how to find content gaps at scale with Python. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey, Antoine, how are you? Thank you for Fine, and you? How are you? I'm great, great. Thank you for being here with us. How, Thank you for the invitation. How is it going in Spain? Absolutely. Um, it's it's cold. <laughs> it's cold today. <laughs> Winter has arrived. Now it's it, it's cold, but apart of that, it's it's great. As I will be on holidays next next week, it's my last day today. Uh, pretty pretty awesome, to be honest. And you, how is it going over there? Yeah, no, th things are here. It's I'm I'm glad we're alive, right? It's, it's just. So much craziness going on, especially here in the U.S. and New Jersey is uh, uh, like everywhere is people are just looking if it's going to be the lockdowns coming down again. I saw a picture on Twitter of in Spain people leaving the city yeah, to go yeah. uh, to the second home you know, ahead of the lockdown coming down. Right? Super crazy. Yeah, yeah, I think it's something that can, well, that can, that will, and that has happened in a lot of countries. And as on Tuesday, it's bank holiday actually in in Spain, in other country as well. I, I think, I think a lot of person I I going back to their yeah secondary homes for the long weekend. But yeah, it will definitely be a strange Christmas this year. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. So. So yeah, so you know the you know our format in the in the is that we want to learn a lot about the you know the, the mind behind the, the Python code and the scripts, you know. So we want to learn a little bit about your journey. I think it's really interesting that that you're French, right? You're living in Spain, right? And uh, it's really I think, and you're doing this Python stuff. And from our previous conversation, you know, you don't come from an engineering background, so I found that's really a really interesting background and. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your personal journey, right? You know, about um, starting from, you know, why, you know, from France to, to Spain, right? You know, Spain is fantastic and I love it. I've been there and I love the food. But, I, you know, tell us a little about your, your, your story. So, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm not an engineer. Actually, I have a marketing background. So I studied in the north of France, in a city called Lille, which is really close to, to Belgium. And during, so during the, these studies, you have to do a bunch of uh, internship. And one of, I mean, uh, one of the first internships that I did was actually in Barcelona, in, so in Spain, in the city I'm, I'm currently living in. So it was like the discovery, you know, the introduction of Barcelona and Spain for, for me. And I was working within a small startup doing, you know, a bunch of, sta a bunch, a bunch of tasks, sorry. And we were basically trying to understand how we can work with the customer acquisition. So we were trying to test, you know, email marketing, paid marketing, and that's, and then the SEO. That was like my first introduction to SEO, how you can optimize website. So some really basic stuff, you know, at, at this point I was like, yeah, you have to optimize your title, your meta description, your H1, and that's it. You, you have your, your website SEO ready or something like this, you know, but uh, then when I ended the internship, so I went back to, to France to pursue my, my, my studies and I started to, yeah, to investigate a little bit. I was reading a lot, actually the Moz blog, which was one of the yeah, one, one I was reading the most very really amazing content and I enjoyed the whiteboard Friday, you know, amazing series. So you have the content if you want if you want to, to read it or you have the, the video. So amazing to as an introduction, you know. And in 2016, so I was doing my last internship in a pharmaceutical company. Uh, nothing to do with SEO because my last internship I wanted to be sure that I wanted to work as a SEO. So what I did was basically a last internship with nothing to do with SEO, just to see, okay, maybe there is another area that I will like. So maybe SEO is just, you know, the thing that I like right now, but there is something better. And I realized actually that, yeah, I wanted to work as a SEO. And I also realized the kind of company I don't want to work for. 
it's not, I don't know if it's the same for all pharmaceutical company, obviously, but this one was the kind of company where, you know, you're judged by the way you're dressed and not the kind of work you're doing. So that's like, yeah, okay, I don't, I want to work in SEO and I don't want to work for that kind of company. And oh, I decided to go to Spain uh, because first, my first experience in Spain was amazing. I mean, very nice people, good weather, good food, as you mentioned, you know. And because my girlfriend is Mexican, we actually met in, in Chile. We were both mm -hmm. of us doing an, an exchange year over there in Valparaiso, very close to Santiago, the capital. Right. And so we were in a long distance relationship, you know, not the very ideal situation, but she had to finish her studies. I had to finish mine. So for a while we were yeah in this kind of long distance relationship and we said in 2016 like yeah we have to decide where we want to live the option i mean we had several options but france was not an option because she didn't speak french uh mexico was not an option either because i had not a big one but a small loan and the amount of money i had to give back to the bank uh, every month why basically higher than the average uh, salary in mexico so you know impossible so we decided to go to to spain for language reason and let's say salary reason and i've joined a company called uh actually i can show it here <laughs> a company called uh, seocom we see the digital agency based in barcelona so first as a ceo junior you know part of a team and then i manage when i mean after learning better how seo works what you have to do how to develop and build a strategy uh, i managed to 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 manage a small team of seo consultants uh, so amazing three years and a half, amazing people, amazing projects. So we worked on a lot of projects, e-commerce, SaaS, B2B, B2C, a bit of everything. So perfect for, you know, the training. So you know what can work in an industry, but is not working in another one. So amazing. And and do you think, do you, sorry. Do you, yeah. Do you think that, that because SEO is always changing, right? That that kept you on your toes and you kept you always looking at new challenges. Do you feel like that also attracted you to the industry? Yeah, 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 definitely. Because that's, that's I mean, the strategies that you may have uh, implemented five years ago, I don't think it's the same one you would recommend right now. You know, so it's like always I mean. changing, always evolving. So that's it's a part of the challenge, let's say, of the industry, because you have to adapt yourself of a very mm -hmm. changing at a fast pace environment. But it's also something that, yeah, okay, uh, I've, I've done that, but that's not the end of everything. You know, I have to always be updated of the new trends. I have to adapt the strategy I've recommended to my clients or to my employee, if uh, employer, sorry, if uh, you're working in-house. So that's, that's the beauty of it. You like it or you don't like it. In my case, I enjoy it because it's, yeah, I, it's not finished. I finished this project, but now I have to move on with another project, another project, you know. That's that's, awesome. that's an amazing thing for in the industry, and it's I mean it's true for a lot of industry right now. You know, digital in industry. I think it's the same for mm -hmm. yeah email marketing, paid marketing. You have to evolve, you have to adapt, obviously. Yeah, and tell us about your your Python journey. Why right? why did you decide on, on Python? Right, especially you didn't come from an that the engineering background, right? And how difficult it was, or you know, how do you how do you evolve in, into doing that, right? Or what do you find that that opportunity uh, and, and and when when did the the python snake beat you right <laughs> uh the the beginning of the story was i think into yeah 2018 or maybe early 2019 um so i was still in silicon in a digital agency and i realized that sometimes i was doing the same task over and over uh, whether for the same clients or for several clients you know very mechanical task where i don't know i download a csv file some data manipulation and you and then you use it as a basis for analysis for instance and i said okay on a weekly basis i may be uh, spending not a lot you know not a full day but half a day on doing this kind of task isn't there a more efficient way of working you know, so I started to investigate and I, yeah, that's when I discovered basically Python that, yeah, you can automate some tasks with, with Python. So I actually bought a book called Automate the Boring 
stuff with Python, which is available for free online if you want, or you can buy, buy uh, yeah, a hard awesome. copy. It's as you prefer. And it was a really good basis, but the issue is the way I tried to learn the language using this book was not the right one, right? I was basically reading the chapters and then trying to adapt the, yeah, the examples provided in the book with my um, own scenarios, own situation, own issues. The issue with that is basically by copying, pasting codes, I was able to execute it, but if it was working, uh, I didn't know why. And if it was not working, I didn't know why either, because I didn't have, you know, like the basics of the language, like the data types, how to build the loop, some really basic stuff. And, and at some point I just, yeah, I just gave up and say, no, I think the Python thing is not for me. And six months later, I found, I mean, I, I watched a presentation done by a guy called uh, Robin Lord, I guess. Yeah, 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 right. This and he, he actually uploaded a drop in a Dropbox folder presentation uh, on uh, why Jupyter Notebook and Python will replace Excel, you know. And oh, yeah. for me, this, this, this presentation was like an eye opener because I was dealing at the time not with the automate things but with a, a client with a lot of data, you know, and I was like hitting the, the limit of Excel in terms of speed, because yeah, if you have 1 million rows in Excel, uh, my, basically my laptop was freezing always. And, and if you need more rows, you, you just can't, you know, it is, there is a limit for, for Excel. So I started to, okay, there is also data application for this language. It's super interesting and it's super useful for me. So I retake basically the training but I sign up in, a, in an online platform called DataQuest, which is really a data oriented. Actually, they, are, they have path for data analysts, data scientists, so very advanced stuff that I didn't do. Uh, but it's not CEO focus, it's CEO focus, sorry. It's data focus, but that's exactly what, la, what I needed. And you have the basics, it's text-based, which for me was perfect because I prefer text training rather than video training, but I guess it depends on on your profile of what you like. And then I was really able, after the training, the proper training and the proper methodology, because this platform is mixing the theory and the practice. You have like interactive playground where you can write your code and it checks automatically if the output is as expected, you know, that kind of exercise. Uh, and that's when I started to not master because I'm not mastering <laughs> Python, uh, but yeah, to create my own solutions to problems I was facing at my work. So that's that's the the Python journey let's, in two chapters. Let's play the devil. No, that's awesome. But let's play the devil's advocate. Why wouldn't you do that on Excel or you know using you know the third party tools? What makes you feel like you had to learn a language to do something that maybe you could do with other tools? I mean, the, the first advantage for me, it's the documentation because Excel is, let's say, awesome if you know uh, how the logic works, which means if I create an Excel, you know, you can have a lot of formula, VLOOKUP, whatever. Uh, if it's not document documented, if I send a file to another person, uh, this person has to understand the logic behind everything. You know, it, it's not like a logical step. If you, you have basically to reverse engineer an Excel file, which in some cases is yeah. really hard. I mean, sometimes I, in the agency, I receive some Excel file not created by me. Uh, the person was not available on holidays or whatever. And, and, you know, you can spend one hour in, in understanding all the logic. It's, it's really hard. And in the code, it's... And it's because it's, you, if you want to make changes to it and adapt it to something else, you don't understand how it's put, it was put together because Excel is point and click to do things, right? And you, exactly. And then person, in a programming language like Python, it's not just doing the automation, right? But it's also describing how it's happening. And you yeah, can yeah. see where you can make the changes. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's that, that's that, and the yeah, and the adaptability, it, it, which which means I have my own issue with it, with Excel. Yeah, sometimes you can solve it, obviously, uh, but in my case, it's okay. I have an issue, but an issue not just with this client. I have exactly the same with this one and this one. I just have to create the process and test it 
for uh, once, and then I can just basically duplicate the same process for all of our clients. And I, I don't have to create again, you know, the same Excel files, modify the references or whatever. I just have maybe to modify um, two lines in my code, in my code, sorry, and, and that's it. I can execute the same analysis, the same process for exactly. all of my clients. Yep. Which also brings the need that, you know, that and we keep saying that you don't need to learn Python to be an effective SEO, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're doing something repetitively, it becomes mind numbing, right? Because you find something that is really successful. But, you know, if, if you're working with a brand with multiple countries, right? Now you have to apply that across all these different regions, right? Or if you're mm -hmm. agency side and you're working with multiple brands, right? You have to apply that across all these different clients, right? So, or you have to repeat the same process, you know, with certain frequency, right? And now it's just, if you're doing it with, with, with Python, it just changed the dates. If you mm -hmm. parameterize your automation, you change the, the sites, you change the dates, and now you have, in, do you invest that initial effort right, of the, to do the automation, which is going to be probably more time than you would do if you were to do it on Excel. Yeah. But you save the time, you amortize that time, right, as you have to repeat the same process, and it's going to take a fraction of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's exactly it. So it's it's exactly what you just explained. If you just do it once, yeah, obviously you don't have to do it in in Python because often uh, Excel, Screaming Frog, or whatever will be way more efficient. But if you have to replicate the same process over and over, several clients or several times a week, a month, whatever, uh, it's way more efficient. And it's not because you know Python that you are a good SEO but you want to be efficient in your work. You don't want to do Super the same powers, task right? over and over. I mean, that's that's not what we paid for and that's not what we like to do. I mean, nobody mm -hmm. likes to download an Excel and do the same data manipulation over and over. You want to create a strategy. You want to be uh, innovative in, in the way you implement it, whatever. And that's the, the time you save by implementing that kind of processes that you will be able to allocate on that more yeah, more interesting tasks, basically. Beautiful. That's awesome. That's, that's really great. So yeah, wh why don't we get to the to your presentation, right? So um, you know, typically we don't require you know to put up to the we you know we're happy to when you want to present you know your walkthrough in a presentation. So so I'm here you know looking forward to learn. And and one of the things that I find really interesting is that I've been doing this is how much you learn just from diversity of opinions, right? So, mm -hmm. and you know, we're a tool vendor, right? But all these use cases that we're seeing, you know, that we consistently see every week, we I wouldn't have thought about it, right? But because you're facing the challenge and everybody says SEO like a generic thing, but SEO for travel is not the same thing as for, for finance, for e-commerce, for, for SMBs. Right? So there is a lot of nuances in driving performance. When you care about driving performance, there is a lot of nuances in, in, and it becomes really interesting actually, right? Perfect, so let's go straight to the presentation. Yeah, I prefer in presentation because in that case, I mean, at least for me, it's easier to explain the logic, the concept, so. Um, Give the context, yeah, exactly. Exactly, so first the context, so yeah, right now I'm working for a company called Liligo, so we are in the, in the travel industry, mainly focused on the French market, even if we have domains in other European countries and the, in the US, but we're mainly known and our main market is the French one. So we will focus not on the travel industry in general, but the let's say the flight industry, okay? Uh, in the flight industry, so that's one really important thing to understand, websites sell the same product, okay? You obviously have some differences between ourselves, Skyscanner, Kayak, to know some, I think, very known brands for everyone in the, in the world. Obviously, user experience or the, the product that you include with the service, yeah, like auto check-in or whatever. Uh, but they, at the end of the day, uh, you sell the same thing, which is a travel from point A to point B. Okay, Skyscanner and actually Skyscanner, Kayak and Arsene, we're not uh, delivering this travel. We're not operating airplanes, that's airlines that will take care of the, of the service. So basically what these websites are selling is the same, okay? 
So when you take a look at the website, you basically have at least uh, these levels in the architecture. The first one is the flight entry. So that's what we call uh, the flight entry in our case. Maybe you have other terminologies in our competitors. It's you know the flight homepage because Skyscanner ourselves, we're selling flights, but also, uh, I don't know, car rentals, hotel accommodation. So you have a page for the flight section. Then you have the flight countries. So that's basically the, the pages uh, created to target queries around the country, so flight to France, flight to Spain, to the US. Then you have exactly the same before cities, so flight to Barcelona, flight to New York. And then you have the flight routes, which are basically the pages targeting a specific route from a specific city to a specific city. That's actually what you are very likely to be looking for if you use a search engine like Google, like, yeah, I'm living in Barcelona. I want to go to Madrid. I will look for flight from Barcelona to Madrid. I won't be looking for flight to Spain or flight Madrid, you know? So that's the typical structure that you can find in almost all websites selling flight tickets. Uh, the demand, something really important, it's the fact that the demand is country-based, which means for the same flights, obviously you won't have the same demand in Spain, in Argentina, or in Mexico, okay? In this example, so Vuelo is flight in, in Spanish, uh, flight Barcelona-Paris obviously will have more demand in Spain, because Barcelona is in Spain, than in Argentina. It's, it's super obvious, but it's to explain the fact that the architecture of a website usually depend on the on the country okay if you take a look at the generic website like i don't know apple the architecture is the same in spain in in mexico in the us okay in the flight industry that's not the case it's mainly depend on the country because the demand is country based and in in this example that i created for this webinar we will have a look at the mexican market for no particular reason because well, i don't know my girlfriend is mexican so perfect uh, we'll focus also just on a part of the architecture, okay, the flight route. Why the flight route? Because it's the most important one. I mean, the average, uh, no, I mean, the, the same demand for the flight route is the most important one, usually in an architecture. And we'll take a look at so for, the websites. Sorry. So for people that are not familiar with the, with the travel industry, what is the difference between a flight entry? I understand the country and the city, right? But what is the difference between a flight entry and a flight route? The flight entry is mainly the homepage for the flight section. Right? It will be, for instance, slash flight. You know, where you have the typical search form, the most common destinations. I don't know. Okay, some it's kind of like the portal. It's kind of like exactly, the... exactly. And the flight routes is a specific page for specific routes, like flight for from Paris to Barcelona. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. okay? Right. And we'll have a look so at two, two websites in the Mexican market, which are Atrapalo and Skyscan. Okay, what's the objective? In that case, we'll assume that we're, we're working for Atrapalo, okay? And see, if I'm working for Atrapalo, I'm looking at Skyscanner and they are doing better than, than ourselves, okay? So why? And one of the assumptions, I mean, one of the hypotheses that we have, it's basically, <clears throat> that Skyscanner is ranking on some queries, not because that they're better than Atrapalo, better content, better user experience, whatever, but because we don't have the content to rank on these queries, okay? And if you do a quick site search in Google, I know it's not a perfect indicator, it's not an exact number, but you can have an ID of the number of pages indexed, even if the number is not accurate. You can see that you have a huge difference between Atrapalo and Skyscanner. Uh, for Atrapalo, it's around 5,000 euros, and for Skyscanner, 17,000. So there is really a huge difference between both websites. So we, we want to check if, okay, maybe they're just generating a bunch of useless content, so we don't care, or maybe no, we don't have the content for specific routes, and that's why they are doing better. We don't have, for instance, I don't know, Mexico, New York. So obviously it's something that we need to add in our architecture. And you have to check it at scale because you can be checking route per route. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, <coughs> in our case, in, in France, uh, we have around 40,000 routes. So you can be checking that one by one, impossible, impossible. Right, just two seconds. <laughs> 
Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense, especially because, you know, how do you do that, you know, with, with, because the tools that you have in the market are not going to be customized to this specific, you know, narrow use case, right? And no, the alternative, exactly. right? The alternative, what is, right? Excel, right? So that's, <laughs> and it will be a lot of work, especially because this, this probably is changing, right? This is a dynamic thing, right? That the, 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 you know, routes can be opening, you know, they can be creating more and more, you know, I'm not exactly you know, very, very familiar, but I, I can think that that intuitively that could be the case. Right? No, that's exactly the case. And you have some situations. Uh, I don't remember if it's the case for one of them, but uh, websites that will basically create a page for every possible route. Okay. Mm. Uh, in, in the world, even if you're just in Mexico or in France. So you end up maybe with a sitemap of uh, 1 million or 2 million URLs. So it's we just impossible to manage. Impossible exactly. to manage in, in Excel. Impossible. And also can dilute the crawl budget, right? Because, you know, there might be never used or searched for, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so that's why in that case, the, the Python solution is, uh, in my opinion, the, the most efficient, you know? Uh, so, as you may have guessed, we are going to use Python to solve this, this issue. And I personally use Google Colab because we, uh, we are running in the Google at work uh, and my, it at Ligo. So, it's easier to share the document with other person, even if they don't have, you know, Python or Jupyter Notebook installed on their local computer, uh, but you can obviously apply exactly the same process and, and use the, the notebook shared by by Hamlet, which is the one we are going to see right now, uh, with Jupyter Notebook is as you prefer. So the first part is, so the setup is basically to say, okay, which libraries are we going to use for, for that, that task? It's pretty simple. So the first two one is Pandas and NumPy. So let's say that Pandas, <clears throat> it's to, to create an Excel-like a variable in in Python, so you can you know you you have like rows, columns, so it's not as Excel, but visually it's basically the same thing. And then piece uh, for algebra or calculus or that kind of that kind of stuff. So the um, ju just to to explain, if someone doesn't know in the in the webinar, when you import a library, basically you are copying, let's say, a code created by someone else so you can reuse it. So you don't have to create everything from scratch. You can benefit from, yeah, third party libraries and the amazing work done by someone else, which is actually the, the case for the third libraries, which is the only one that doesn't come pre-installed in Google Colab. So it's a, <coughs> a library called AdvertTool. Advert Tools done by the person I just included in the, in the screenshot by Elias. Yeah. And it's, it's, He's in the in the in the chat. He's in the ah. So hi, Elias. <laughs> but uh, amazing, amazing but, uh, library and a huge time. Elias, story. you want to join? You want to join us in? Yeah, Elias, you want to join us in the panel? You know, we really can bump you up if you want. If he says, well, I let, mean, us we, wanna, let us let us know if you want to join. Oh, great, <laughs> so Brittany, bump him up here. Uh, promote him as a panelist. So we have. So you want to continue? Uh, okay. Antoine. So yeah, but well, I think you will speak better <laughs> like myself about his, his library. But in that case, it's a huge, uh, huge time server for me. And you will see just after why. So here you have a different uh, way of including it. Why? Because pandas and np are pre-installed in Google Colab, so I don't have to install them. In a case on advert tools, it's not pre-installed. Okay, so what I do is a try ex except statement, which basically say try to import uh, adverb tools, and if uh, if we get an error, which is basically the case if the if the library is not installed, uh, then first install it and then import it. That's the good way of sharing your work, you know, because the person can execute the cell and the person won't have to face an error and to modify the script uh, himself or herself. You know, so that's uh, that's the simplest way for me to including, let's say, not standard libraries. Uh, then you have to download the sitemap. So the sitemaps, why do we use sitemap and not the crawl of the website? It's basically to be uh, efficient. 
in for this specific scenario, I don't need the content. Okay, I don't care uh, about uh, title, H1, meta description, internal linking, whatever. I don't care. I just want to see if there is a content. So if we can find a sitemap, I get basically a list of URLs and I don't have to crawl them. To download the sitemap, maybe it's, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds. To crawl a full website, a travel website, maybe may it can be one day, you know? So it's a huge time saver as well. And that's where, oh, sorry. No, I, I, you know, Elias joined. So Elias, you want to, you know, make any comments about it? There's a better way to do this, right? You know, we're all learning. This is your tool, your library. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We can hear you. Thank you very much. Very happy to uh, to be discussing this. Um, uh, it's great to know it's it's uh, useful to other people and. Uh, there's definitely so many different things to improve uh, on it. Um, I mean, it's it's a straightforward uh, to go. You're doing it perfectly. Um, <laughs> so recently, the the uh, an up, the, the recent update was using concurrent um, requests, which made it much oh, faster awesome. than previously. So two versions ago, it was you know you had to wait for every Brilliant. site app to download. Yeah. which would take uh, some time. Now it's, it's uh, faster. Um, actually, I want to listen to your feedback. Uh, if you have problems, if you have suggestions. Um, yeah. What version, you know, so, so, so Antoine, what version number you know are you using? I so don't, you I, uh, that... to, to be honest, I don't, I don't know which version. Okay, I, think so it's the it. I think that's the last one, but the last one, I mean, the last time I executed the notebook, I think it's well, maybe seven days ago or something like this. So I don't know which version I'm using. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably the latest one because on Collab, you have to install it every time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> a, a, an interesting thing might always be that once you download the sitemap is there's a follow-up function for it, which is URL to data frame, URL to DF. Uh, which splits the the URLs into folders and, and subdomains and query parameters if you have it. So it makes uh, the analysis uh, easy yeah. as well. So that, that might be interesting to, to use. But um, yeah, go ahead Thank if you, you want. I'll, I'll just... Let's continue. Yeah, so that we can get more feedback as to Actually, the, 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 the method that Yazi is, is talking about would have been a quicker way maybe of extracting the data I will extract just, just after we explain that. But I was not aware of the method, to be honest. So I think there is actually a smarter way of, of, doing, of doing that using the method that he just, uh, he just talked about. So, uh, so yeah, to go back to this to this part, so yeah, very straightforward. We basically download the sitemap, okay, or sitemap index. That's that's the beauty of the library. It doesn't matter if you are dealing with a sitemap or sitemap index. It's smart enough to download all the information for you. And how to find the sitemap, the sitemap URL? Uh, you can obviously try some really. Uh, simple routes, you know, sitemap that like XML, sitemap index or stuff like that. Or you can have a look at the robot.txt file, which is some, I mean, very often included there. So, so you can have the direct URL for the sitemap. Uh, so I get all the information from the sitemap. So as we mentioned earlier, we're just interested in the flight routes. Obviously, here I will have the hotel, the car rental, flight country, so everything. That's not something I want to do. So in that case, the information returned by Elias library needs to be filtered. So one way of doing that is uh, the Boolean indexing. So one of the great functionality of the library as well is when you have the URL, as you can see here, you also, you also know which sitemap the URL was found in, okay? And in our case, it's it's perfect because uh, for both Atrapalo and Skyscanner, uh, they include, you know, a descriptive name in the sitemap. It's something like, you know, flight, route, one, or something like this, okay? So you can filter the data frame by saying, okay, I just want to keep the site, the, the, the information where the uh, sitemap value included in the, in this column contains the word root. In that case, it's exactly the same instruction for both Atrapal and Skyscanner because it's the same logic. 
you know, here you have the example for Skyscanner. This is the sitemap index. You know, you have ES underscore MX underscore root. So that's the flight routes. And I just, to, I just have to filter the original data frame based on that condition. And for Skyscanner, I do exactly the same, okay? So first, let's say advantage of Python over Excel here, it's way more efficient and more, yeah, faster to do that. Now, okay, I have this information, but uh, if we go back a little bit, okay, again, we're working for Atrapalo versus Skyscanner. I want to know which routes we have, I mean, which route they have that we don't, okay? So we have to do some kind of matching. I have to match my content with theirs. And how can you do that? You can use an information. So it's the airport codes, which is a unique identifier for an airport. It's unique in the world. I mean, MEX, you can't have the same in, I don't know, Mexico and France, for instance, it's unique worldwide. And it's uh, free, free letters always. And you usually have this information uh, or whether on the, in the URL, so it's the case for Skyscanner and Trapalo, or in the content. In that case, it's perfect because it's the URL. So it means that we don't have to crawl the full list and to extract an information. That's something that we could have uh, done, but it's obviously more time consuming. In that case, we have this information directly in the, in the URL. So by extracting the information from the sitemap, we actually have all the information we need. We just have to extract it so we can reuse it después, uh, after, sorry. <laughs> Spanish <laughs> <by hand>. <laughs> <laughs> So how can you do that? So you can use uh, something called the regex extraction. So it's really, really similar to the regex extract function in, in Google Sheets. I think that in Excel, you don't have an, an equivalent, but I, I have to know that I use more uh, Google Sheets than Excel, so maybe there is. So basically, you use a regular expression where you include between parentheses the part of the content that you want to, to extract. If you don't know how regex works, it's not that complicated, but you can use a website called regex101.com where basically you include a content. So it can be a text, a list of URL, whatever. And then you include at the top uh, the regex rule and it will tell you if it matches with your content and the parts of the contents that you will be extracting. So I don't, you don't have to try your code directly, you know, in, in Python, in Colab by running, running, running again and again until it works. You can try it first in this website, which is amazing because it explains you the rules or everything. And then when it works, you just copy paste the regex expression directly in your, in your code. So by, by doing that, basically I will have the original information, so the sitemap information, and then I will have the original airport, I mean the origin airport and the destination airport. So basically the information I need then to match the content between Skyscanner and Atrapan. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me, then, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, Elias, I think you have a feature, right? That, that could do that, you know, in the, in the library, right? Because I think you have a way to break out the URLs. Yeah, that's, that's that, the URL exactly. to, yeah, yeah. yeah, URL to DF, no, it was, no? Yes, just one uh, caution here you because want, you want to go back uh, to so, 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 yeah. so, so, uh, it, it works perfectly fine if if the URL structure is consistent in the website. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it you know it, it splits the directories as directory one, directory two, directory three, and so on. Now sometimes you have websites that have a language code as the first directory. And the default language maybe does, doesn't have a code there and the other languages would. So your data frame will not be aligned uh, properly. So you have to do some manipulation there. But if, if it's, I think this website is, is consistent, both of them. So you say yeah. vuelos from to rutas and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to do it. Just keep this in mind. But otherwise, yeah, it's... Yeah, so Elias, if you, if you could create a, a simple gist to illustrate this, and we can link it if, if you want, you know, we can link Absolutely. it so they, they know. Because I want people to learn to use the, the, all the, 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 the simplification features that you added to the tool, to the, to your library. So I, I think that. that'll be, 
that would be one. No, I think it's better because you get rid basically of the regex extraction, uh, which I mean, regex is not that complicated, but if you you don't know if you can how it to works, apply it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah, exactly. No, and that's what I thought it was a good idea to invite Elias so that you know he's the, the master in that. He he will make it even simpler for us to understand. So Elias, mm -hmm. we made you put a share like I did as well, right? <laughs> uh, how about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. So you want you want to continue and talk? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So at this uh, at this step, so basically I have extracted you know the origin airport and the destination airport. So what I want to do is basically to append this information so I get the full route. So it's basically here. It's like the concatenate function in in Google Sheets or in in Excel, where basically I will append the from airport, then an iPhone, and then the two airports. So I get the full the full routes. Okay. Uh, so one important thing is a uh, remind, reminder of the initial objective. I don't want to list just all the contents that my competitor has and that I don't, because if they're, if they're just generating useless contents, basically I don't care, you know? So what I want to do is just to list the useful content. And in terms of SEO, that's a content that can rank and that can generate, you know, uh, some sessions and at the end of the day, some revenues, which is the ultimate uh, KPI, you know? So mm -hmm. we have to extract information from a third party database, in that case, SEMrush, it can be Systrix, href, whatever you, you want to use with the traffic information. So what we will be doing, so first, obviously, you have to go to SEMrush and download the traffic per, per page. So you, you go, you click, you, you search a domain, you go to organic research, and you have a tab called uh, pages, and you can extract this, uh, this information. If you are dealing with a very huge website, you may have some limitation based on your plan. Uh, I think in ours, it's, for instance, uh, 15,000 rows or something like this. But you, you, you can filter after and get the information you, you need. Okay, so, and then I basically remove the useless column. So here I say, okay, because the SEMrush file includes a lot of information, you know, the, the URL, the, the traffic percent, the traffic in number and other information that I don't need for that specific use case. So what I do here is basically to say, uh, okay, it's that file that you will load, but please just keep the URL and traffic information. That's the way I work. I usually try to remove the useless information because after that, you can end up with a really large data frame, meaning a lot of columns, and it's hard to keep track of what you need and what you don't. But obviously, it's an optional step, and as you as you prefer. Some person prefer to yeah uh, keep all the information and then remove everything. In my case, I prefer to remove the useless columns on the go. And then that's, yeah, I call it the magical part. It's not that magical, but that's where we are going to do the, the main part of the analysis. So first, I will create all the missing routes, okay? So what I do is basically to say, okay, create me a data frame, including only the flight from, I mean, the flight routes from Skyscanner that are not included in Atrapalo. And to do that, I will use so this column that I created, you know, the roots where we append the origin and destination. So it's like a unique ID per root that will say, please just keep the, the columns where the roots in Skyscanner is not in the roots in Atrapalo. So that's exactly the first step that we need to, to do. Then again, I will apply the same logic. I remove uh, the columns that I don't need, okay? From because when you do that, uh, you have some uh, some information that I will not need at the end of the this analysis. Thought, so I remove them. Then I do a little manipulation because the step, uh, I mean the last step is to merge uh, two data frames. When you merge a data frame, I mean two data frames, you have to merge on a column. Okay, that's like when you you do a VLOOKUP, you have to <coughs> you have to find. Uh, a value, okay, I mean a column where you say, okay, look for that information in that column and return me, I don't know, the third or the fourth columns, something like this. So it's exactly the same. But if you have the same information in two columns with not the same name, I will end up with, that's exactly what I said, two columns with different information and the same 
uh, different time story and different information. So it will be kind of useless. So what I do is to rename a column in the missing, so the data frame called missing, okay? So the name is consistent between the two data frames that I, I will, will merge. And then we, you merge the information. So in that case, I say, okay, you have all the missing routes. So that's the thing that we create here in the first step. You will merge this information with the traffic information I downloaded from SEMrush, okay? To add the traffic information for the missing routes. So I will end up exactly with what I need is the routes included in Skyscanner, but not included in Atrapalo, which are generating for, for Skyscanner at least or may generate at least for Skyscanner uh, traffic, okay? So with traffic information in, in, in SEMrush. Yeah, let, let me add. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so let me add that that is the default on the merge. So merge is the equivalent of, of you know, if you guys are familiar with a SQL, when you're doing joins between data, data, data tables. So the default join is what is called an inner join, which is an intersection between the two data sets. But there is an outer join, there's all the different type of joins. But in this case, when you do this join, it's going to exclude the rows that don't match. So then you, you have. I think that's the default in Pandas. Uh, the default is, is merge on inner. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Inner, it's yeah, yeah, I think it's inner. Yeah. yeah inner it's a great a idea, default. by the way, the, the combination of data from other sources to prioritize. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's called <laughs> data blending. That's what he's called the magical part, right? I no, it's cool because, that I'm yeah. <laughs> no, because the thing is that what you're showing here is that, you know, you know, everybody uses multiple tools, right? And now you're leveraging information from different tools like SEM Rush, you know, and the data that you're collecting from your uh, from your data set and combining it, right? Yeah. In providing you new insights that you didn't have before because they exist in different in different tools. Right? Exactly. And, and that's actually, let's say, the, the almost end. Then you have, obviously, to take a look at the result because you always will have some false positive, you know, because, I don't know, you the structure of some yeah, yeah. is matched with the flight routes or whatever. You, you have to, obviously, remove them. And then you end up with a file like this. And from a business perspective, because at the end of the day, why are we doing that? Because we are working on the SEO strategy or content, and we have to end up with business recommendations. When we look at these routes, so again, I repeat, but it's interesting routes from Skyscanner that we don't have, and we can't rank on these queries if we don't have a content to rank on. Uh, we see, for instance, take a look at the second rows that we have some European routes, okay? From So FRI is uh, Frankfurt in Germany and BCN is Barcelona in Spain. So remember when I said that the demand is country-based, so it can make sense, okay, to exclude a route between Germany and Spain in a Mexican website. But actually what can, what you can, you can show, I mean, what you can see, you can investigate, it's obviously some Mexican that plan a European trip and will look for the flight ticket directly from Mexico. Maybe they will land first, I don't know, in Paris, in London, in Barcelona, Madrid, whatever, but then they may want to visit another city. So they will need to buy flight tickets inside the European Union. And if you take a look at the, at the file, that's basically 80% of, of the results. So in that case, if I'm working for Atrapalo, it's like, okay, we need to add some European routes in our Mexican website because we have demand in Mexico and we can't rank on these queries if we don't have the content. And the beauty of, that's the beauty, yeah. The beauty of that analysis is here I'm just comparing myself with Skyscanner, but if I want to compare myself to other competitors, because Skyscanner is obviously not the only one with good ideas, you just have to change a little parts of the code, for instance, the sitemap URLs and the way of extracting the information for the routes. And you can generate exactly the same analysis in a matter of minutes. And if you want to do the same analysis between Atrapalo and Skyscanner for the Mexican market, but also for the Spanish market, the American market, or I don't know in which market Atrapalo is operating, but you know, you get the point. Uh, you just have to change basically uh, the domain name, so the URL for the sitemap, 
and again the way of extracting the <coughs> the um, the airport codes and that's it so that's exactly what Amlet mentioned at the beginning of the of the webinar is okay that task maybe i could come up with a quicker solution of doing of doing that uh, using another another method not python but that if i want to do it twice three times four times or maybe just update the same analysis once a week you know uh, because the routes are dynamics or whatever uh, it will be a huge time saver so yes you are going to lose a bit of time by creating and testing this script but if you want to rerun it again some other country other competitors you will save a lot of time and, and this that's is it. wonderful yeah this is this is um no this is great so so let's see if you guys have any questions we we still have like 10 minutes see if there are so we can see if there are any questions from the panel from the uh, participants um, for, you know, Antoine, you can ask them in Spanish as well. We will have to translate them. <laughs> or, yeah. or in French, or in French. <laughs> <laughs> or in French. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't understand the French ones, but I think we could do that. Um, so yeah, and, and Elias, do you have any other uh, things, you know, if we go back at, at the presentation while people ask questions? Um, that you no, think could leverage could leverage additional features on your on your on your library. Um, I think I just want to emphasize what 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 uh, Antoine did and what you just said, which is now you're enriching all the other tools that you have, so you're not stuck with any tool. You can you can grab data from different places and and yeah. play with them the way you want, and. Uh, this is this is uh, this is great what you're doing and like it's you're you're playing with the data the way you want. <clears throat> uh, if if someone is is lazy, you can you can just give it a robots.txt file and it will extract the sitemaps for you and get them. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> that's it's, it does the, the function does that if you give it a, a robots.txt file, but. Uh, the URL to DF thing was was um, an interesting one. No, yeah, other, other than that it's 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 like um, once once you figure out the URL structure of a site, then as you just did, then you can then you can do all the things that you want. You just have to, you know, figure out what what what's going on. Sometimes you have um, uh, query parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, which would be more interesting also if you split them with, with URL to DF because then every parameter will have its own column and the values would be in those columns. So if, if you say, if you have prices, let's say price equals 10, color equals blue, you can say, show me the prices of the blue items or give me the, 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 the color, the blue items that have a price that's greater than 10 or whatever you have. Uh, but that's if you have uh, query parameters in, in, in your data set. I think you have some questions. No, they're saying that they're, they're, right. they're happy with the, with the presentation. Great. Oh, okay. Um, so you want to show the, the, the next webinar? So we're going to give it a shout out. So this, this is recorded and Brittany's going to upload it today at our YouTube channel. We have more presentations, you know, it's, it's a growing list. A presentation from Elias and Charlie, a lot of really great, you know, talent in the community. And this one is going to join the Hall of Fame, right? Um, so you want to hit present and get to the last slide so they can see that. Okay, sorry. Oh. The next webinar that we're. You want to hit refresh so that you can, yeah, oh, this refresh one. see that. Sorry. Yeah. So the next one is going to be in Spanish. This one was supposed to be in Spanish, but we didn't, you know, for logistics, I, I wasn't on top of what's going on, but I guess, you know, everybody, you know, benefited because uh, we get the, some English speaking people here in the community. So next week it's going to be in Spanish and it's going to be about um, doing categorization of content using NLP, the yeah, Google NLP API. So I'm really looking forward to checking that one. Uh, and uh, it's going to be by Daniel Heredia. Yeah, he works at 
in the e-gaming industry. Um, so it looks like I, we have a question. Uh, so how can we extract information from URLs via signups? For example, agency names listed on clutch signups, sign up in Mexico. Who want to take that? Um, I, I, so, I can if you, if you want. I mean, <clears throat> here it's it's um I, in my in my case uh, I usually don't rely only on on Python if it's a lot a lot a lot of URLs because requests. But that's basically because I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge on how to do the you know the multi processing. Okay, so in my case, if if I have to extract information directly from uh, a list, a very large list of URLs, I usually use Screaming Frog or whatever. But I believe that with uh, Elias library, you can uh, exactly do that. So I think you can take the, the Python part. I think you, you can leverage your library to extract things, right? Using Scrappy. Yes, there is, it has a, a crawler, so you can crawl so if you want, you can have step one would be to download the, the XML sitemap. And then you would either, you could, you could give the list of URLs to the crawl function and it would crawl them all. Uh, you, could, you could have a subset, for example, just like you did here. Maybe you're not interested in everything. You just want vuelos and certain destinations. Um, and you can do that. Um, and it has many options of like XPath and CSS extraction and a few other options, but yeah, that, that you could, you could do that or any other crawler as well. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the, only, the only thing I guess is to have yeah, a way of identifying the information you want to, to extract. So usually with XPath. And the selectors you can just, you know, you, you know, select the text in the browser, right click on it and you can copy the selectors. Yeah, and uh, and I I have a um, a sheet sheet a Python sheet sheet that actually has a has some scraping code a uh, code on it. So I will share the link. I gave that presentation uh, inbound, and it's very introductory because it, it gives you the you know building blocks to what I did is I scraped content from uh, the Shopify. Um, theme store to perform page speed analysis automatically. So that's really cool, right? So let me uh, share it here because you could adapt that to, um, you could adapt it um, to, to that use case of, you know, scraping agencies from clutch, right? So that could be useful, right? So, so yeah, so I think, you know, really excited. You know, we have a, a big lineup of speakers up to April, I think now. So it's amazing. Oh, wow. We're really, really excited week by week. So it's, it's just incredible. Um, nice. And um, yeah, it's awesome. And and the webinars page on our site, Brittany, you want to post a link to the webinars page? We have the few ones that we have already, you know, Got, gather enough information. We have like four of them. I mean, including this one. So this month we have like four with this one, right? And and we're taking a break at the end of the month. And then we're going to have the other one for the next year. So it's really exciting. And there is also a link for you. If you want to join, if you're learning, remember, you don't have to be an expert on this. That's what I want to make it. It's, yeah. This is about learning from your journey, right? Um. So, Rina, I think you send it directly to me. So, make sure that you send it to the whole list. So, you, um, yeah, this is, we're all learning together, right? So, it's, you know, and this is not about being sophisticated or what, you know, it's just what is the problem, the context, right? And where Python fits in to give you superpowers, right? Because small code changes. And look at the benefit, the impact that you're having. And also you're having fun. You're learning, you're innovating, you know, making your job a lot more interesting as well, right? Documenting yeah. what you're doing is all wonderful, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so thank you very much. You know, really excited, you know, sur our surprise guests, Elias and uh, thank you. Antoine. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, Charlie's is teasing you like you, you don't miss a single one. He's saying on Twitter. So <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about being the host. You know, moving <laughs> forward. <laughs> so, 
So guys, thank you very much. Have a fantastic um, weekend and uh, see you on the next one. Thank you. Maybe. Thank you very Bye. much and have a nice weekend. Bye. Thanks. Bye.